very closely with the Amnesty Group in my constituency. And I had, uh, just as a sort of sign of us being in government, it was fantastic when they came to my surgery about three <coughs> weeks ago, and they said, we've always enjoyed working with the local MP, but if we're really honest, we never thought that you would also be the minister responsible for human rights. And I said, well, you know, you can drop in and see the minister any time you like now, and they seemed, uh, seemed pleased. So I'll let you know <laughs> any, uh, any <laughs> conversations we, we have. <coughs> and I am the minister responsible. Well, <laughs> yes, indeed, probably a rash offer to admit. Um, I am the minister. I mean, the way we organise the Foreign Office is obviously the Secretary of State is responsible for Britain's relations with uh, everywhere. Um, but beyond <coughs> that, uh, we di divide up the world geographically. This sounds uh, extremely grand. It is quite grand, but, um, but that's an obvious way to do it. And so I have geographic responsibilities for Latin America and for Pacific Asia. Uh, and within that are quite a lot of countries, uh, if we're being undiplomatic about it, that regularly feature on the radar uh, in relation to this subject. China uh, is a case in point. Burma uh, is a country I have responsibilities for. Uh, quite large parts of Southeast Asia there are uh, issues of concern on human rights. And then over in South America, um, <coughs> Colombia uh, has had historic uh, problems and there are other countries there. Uh, that have a lot of progress to make. So I have specific geographic responsibilities, but we also have responsibilities that are <coughs> not specific to geography, and one of mine is for human rights policy in the department. And I suppose I should start by giving you an unequivocal guarantee that we as a party, and to be fair to the Conservatives, we as a government, uh, will continue to give as much, if not more, emphasis to the importance of human rights as any previous government has in this country. It is uh, an inalienable and core principle of ours. And I would uh, recommend, if you, if you have the time, um, that you read a speech that William Hague made on this subject about a week and a half ago. Uh, he's, he's making four speeches that are trying to set out his vision for foreign policy in, in different fields. Uh, and the third of those four speeches he <coughs> delivered about a week and a half, two weeks ago uh, in London uh, on values and human rights uh, and I saw several drafts of it, it was widely consulted uh, on in the department and you may not agree with every word, you may feel that one or two of the uh, references are ones that you wouldn't have made even if you don't disagree with them uh, but I hope and believe that you will be reassured, encouraged, maybe even enthused by the uh, overall content of that speech um, and there have been some press reports uh, inaccurate press reports <coughs> that the government is going to soft pedal on human rights. I want to just say that that is, that is not the case. And I have a deep philosophical uh, attachment to uh, human rights. It's not a pragmatic view. I start from the assumption that, you know, all, well, as they say in America, it's a bit dated, all men, all people <coughs> uh, are born free. That that it's not for the state to grant you human rights, that rather assumes that the state has, has, those, has your rights to start with and makes a decision about how many to give to you. For me, the, the state's authority <coughs> is derived from what we as individuals vest in the state. So the state is the servant of us as people, uh, not our master. And we need to think in, in those terms. I think there are quite a lot of countries in the world <coughs> where, where, they, where they don't see eye to eye with us on human rights it's because their starting point is they want a strong state uh, and that state may on occasions as an act of charity grant some additional human rights to its citizens that is not my starting point that's coming to, for me from the wrong end of the equation and we continue to raise <coughs> even when it's awkward and inconvenient <coughs> human rights issues uh, Everywhere I go, pretty much, or everywhere where there is an, a necessity to raise them, they come up. I was having a meeting in Beijing uh, <coughs> last Wednesday lunchtime, so that takes about a week ago, with, with my opposite number in the Chinese government. And I had a, a, a protracted and at some points quite awkward discussion with her about human rights, about our values, what we thought was uh, important. And I want to see every country in the world have the strongest uh, human rights record, although uh, I accept that Rome wasn't built in the day. Uh, I accept that we have to deal with the world as it is rather than as we would like it to be. 
And I'm also encouraged when I see evidence of progress being made, even if that country has not gone as far as we would like yet. I think we still need to coax people in the right direction. We need to encourage them. I was very uh, complimentary, for example, when I was in the Philippines a couple of months ago, that they have abolished the death penalty. They are ahead of the game in Southeast Asia. I said, I hope that other countries in this part of the world will look to you, that you will regard that as a good selling point, as an example of your leadership within the region. I was in Japan also about two weeks ago. Uh, they execute very few people, numerically, but they still do, and they still have the death penalty on the statute book. I said to them, I thought that was an area where they could really push forward. To put it, or put it even in crude terms, uh, it's probably quite a helpful area of political differentiation between them and the Chinese that they are a, a country that is making demonstrable progress on areas of human rights of that sort. So uh, it comes up the whole time in the meetings we are having, uh, and it's not just about, uh, about the records of governments. Uh, also, I hope we have a broader view about the rights of the individual, uh, the freedoms of the individual. Sometimes individuals are persecuted not by governments, but by other people, by other organisations, and we want to be uh, resolute and vigilant in their defence of their freedoms uh, in that sense as well. So it's not, sometimes governments can uh, be, the, be the perpetrators of offence against human rights, sometimes actually governments can uh, be the protectors of people's rights uh, as well. So we need to have a, a thoughtful, <coughs> uh, nuanced approach, but not an approach which compromises on our fundamental values and that is uh, our position. Just a final thing I'd say before I sit down on Burma. Uh, very nice you could come, uh, Rainin. I've heard, uh, heard you speak before and I'm looking forward to hearing you speak again. But the government uh, could not be more unequivocal uh, in terms of our position on Burma. Um, the Prime Minister himself, uh, the Foreign Secretary, uh, and me, uh, as the responsible minister for Burma, uh, have all spoken repeatedly uh, on the subject in recent months, and particularly around the uh, elections that are taking place. And our position is that it is impossible to uh, hold a set of elections and claim that they accurately reflect popular sentiment in a country <coughs> when over 2,000 people in that country are imprisoned because of their political beliefs and people are not allowed to offer themselves forward uh, as candidates. The outcome <coughs> must be uh, illegitimate if you start from that position. Uh, and that is the position of the British government, I can say. It's not a position that is universally held even within the European Union. There are others who are keen for us to compromise. <coughs> um, and Britain, within European Union um, is a leader uh, on human rights generally and on the issue of Burma specifically. So that is our position and that is how it will continue and I am looking to all of you to help me and empower me to make sure that our liberal values shine brightly in this regard in government in the years ahead.